Good morning and God bless you. It is a delight to be able to be here with you this morning. We've had some very cold weather and I'm glad that uh, you have survived that. I know some of us, uh, some among us have, uh, have struggled just a little bit with the weather and uh, weather related situations. Uh, uh, especially concerned about Mike and you know ribs don't heal quickly and he's got three broken and so it's a uh, it's a real struggle for, for him to have to just even breathe from day to day. But uh, we can be thankful to God that uh, regardless of the weather around us and the circumstances of our life, uh, heaven is a real place and our God lives. And uh, through it all, one day we will see him face to face. What a joy it is to uh, be able to be together in the name of Jesus, to uh, think about our God, to praise Him, to study His Word, to sing songs of praise, to eat this supper, uh, to give from our hearts that which uh, uh, He has uh, blessed us with. So let's turn to God's Word and let's see what we can uh, learn today that might be of some encouragement to us as we try to live uh, for Jesus for the rest of this week. We were reading in Luke chapter 10, and Jesus asked the young lawyer, What's written in the law? How do you read? Jesus had been tempted by that man. The man was, well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, just like many people in this world today, uh, they ask a question, but they don't really want to hear the true answer. <laughs> Some of us want to be told, hey, you're okay. Just go on and do things your way. People asked Peter, you know, on that one occasion, the first time he preached the gospel after Jesus returned to heaven, uh, men and brethren, what must we do? And when pe people ask that question today, some, some folks like to give the answer, well, just don't, uh, you know, just, just believe and just love and just be nice and you'll be okay. Peter gave an answer that many people today don't want to hear. I think maybe the answer that Jesus gave to that young man falls into that category as well. Because how do you read? Well, you mean I have to take time to read? I thought my teachers and preachers would just read it all for me and just tell me the short version of it. It's hard to read through the whole Bible to uh, find all of the facts that I want because they're not listed on a single page in a numbered list with a frame around them so they're easy to find. No, they're not. God wants us to spend time with His Word there's so much more that we can learn while we're looking for the specific answer to the specific question. We can learn who God is and we can learn who we are and what is our relationship with Him and with other people around us. Sometimes maybe that's what some of us don't want to learn. But God sent us a book and expects every one of us to read from it. But how? How do we read the Bible? How can we understand what's in the Bible? One man over here will read it and tell us it says this, and another over there will read it and say, no, it teaches that. They'll give all different answers to the various questions or give us different promises of what it means to be a Christian and what we can expect if we follow after God. If we assume that it is possible to understand the Bible, and it is possible. We've talked about that before. We can understand the Bible. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, when you read, you may understand. It's not always easy. It doesn't always come instantly, but we can understand it if we will give the effort to read it. But the question sometimes is asked, well, then can we all understand it alike? If we, uh, if we read it on this side of the room and, and under, think we got it figured out or read it on this side of the room, are we going to come up with the same answers and is it necessary that we do so? Well, many have concluded that it's not necessary and it's not possible for everybody to read the Bible and get the same thing from it. And so they come up with the idea and with the doctrine that one faith is as good as another. But the whole Bible teaches on practically every page that that's not the truth. So our conclusion is false. There must be something wrong with our reasoning. The confusion that comes from that kind of thinking is not from God. God is not the author of confusion. 
God is the author of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Corinth and put these words in what we call chapter 14 and verse 33, said that in every church down the road, the same doctrine is preached, the same facts are understood, the same responsibility is known from reading the one book that God gave to us. But we don't see that situation in the world today. Why is it? Is there something wrong with the book? The book hasn't changed. It's the same book it was when Paul and Peter and the others were writing it. It's the same book that uh, the world knew a hundred years after the, the uh, death of Jesus. A thousand years. Two thousand years. We've still got the same book. Oh, it's been translated into numerous different languages and several times. So that all the translations don't read word for word exactly the same, but that's a simple fact of a, 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 a result simply of the fact that, that men speak different languages and that all of our languages are living languages. I think they change from time to time. And if you don't think that's true, uh, if you're younger, just sit down with your grandfather and listen to how crazy that old man sounds. And if you're grandpa, sit down with the kids and think, what in the world is this world coming to? <laughs> you know, Because the language changes. And people use terms differently or use completely different terms to refer to the same thing. So it's right that we should have modern translations of the scriptures. But of course, they must be accurate translations of what's there. And when they are, we've got the same book that we've always had. Can we all understand the Bible like the truth of the matter is that if you understand the Bible and if I understand the Bible, we understand it a lot. Because the Bible is just one book. It just says one thing on the page. How we understand it is in our own minds. And so at the heart of the matter is the question of how do I read the Bible? How do I interpret what I'm looking at on the page? How am I supposed to assemble these words into the message that was intended by the original author, which, of course, is God, not the person who put pen to paper? When we begin to look at the different translations of Scripture, we find that there are essentially two methods of Bible interpretation. If we're trying to look at the Bible or try to figure out what's right in the world today and what's, what's, what God wants us to do, uh, we're going to fall into one of these two categories generally. And they might be worded slightly different in different places, but basically this is it. One group will say, whatever is not expressly forbidden in the scriptures is permissible. And another group will say, well, whatever is not authorized in the scriptures is not permitted. It is forbidden. Well, these two statements might seem to lead to the same conclusion in some circumstances, but there really is a big difference. The first of these uh, philosophies or policies or procedures uh, says that if the Bible doesn't say that thing that you're doing is wrong, then that thing that I'm doing is not wrong. If it doesn't have it printed out there just in so many words, in other words, thou shalt not do that thing that you're doing, well, then it's permissible to do that thing. And there are many, many people who follow that uh, philosophy of Bible interpretation. The second sentence, uh, the second uh, policy or procedure is quite a bit different. It says that before I can determine that anything is permitted, I must find the authority for it in the Bible. Authority is determined in the Bible or in any other document that we might pick up in one of two ways. Either by explicit statement in so many words, the Bible will say thus and so. Uh, an example would be when Jesus told the servants to fill the jars with water, John chapter 2 and verse 7. You take these jars and you fill them with water. That's a specific direct statement of instruction. They knew what they were authorized and commanded to do. So an explicit statement like that might tell us 
what God expects of us. The other way that authority is clearly established is by implication. You remember when Philip uh, met the Ethiopian on the road to Gaza? The scripture says that Philip preached unto him Jesus, and then the next verse, the eunuch said, see, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? The implication in this is that when you preach Jesus, you preach water, you preach baptism. And you preach the necessity of baptism. I must be baptized. Here's water, why not now? The man drew that conclusion based on what Philip had preached. So we understand by logical implication that Philip had preached to him something about baptism and its necessity in obeying Jesus. Some people have added a third uh, way that authority is established and they will add uh, approved apostolic example or something similar to that. But in actual point of fact, this also is an implication. When we see what the apostles approved, what the Holy Spirit approved in the days of the apostles, we conclude, we understand the implication that that is approved by God and that is authorized for us. For example, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Scripture says they came together on the first day of the week to break bread it's not a command, it's a historical statement and narrative of what happened. But we understand from that that the church comes together on the first day of the week. That's a logical uh, conclusion implied by the sentence of the record that they came together on that first day of the week. So we know that eating the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week is authorized and expected by God. Let's look at some other illustrations with regard to this. Let's look at, for example, how this applies to the eating of the Lord's Supper. The first statement that we've looked at here, if it's not specifically forbidden, then it's authorized, would allow T-bone steak or biscuits and gravy or your favorite dinner on the Lord's table. If, so, if not, why not? The Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not have T-bone steak on the Lord's table. So why couldn't I have that? If that's the right philosophy of interpretation. But you see, the second policy or philosophy or method of interpretation would preclude steak on the table because the Bible explicitly says that it's unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. That's the only thing that's authorized. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 19, Jesus came to the table to eat unleavened bread. And in Luke 22, verses 17 and 18, he says, I will not drink any more of this fruit of the vine with you until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, the unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine are on the table when we come to the memorial of the Lord's death. And that's the only thing the Bible authorized. That's very specific. That's all that God permits for us today when we come to eat the Lord's Supper. When we eat the Lord's Supper, what do we eat? If we follow the not expressly forbidden crowd, we can't exclude anything from the table. We can put anything there that uh, we might choose to put there. And that seems to be perhaps what some were doing in Corinth. If you look at the 10th chapter, the first epistle, you'll see that Paul was upbraiding them for their making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. Each one bringing his own supper and making a... Uh, a difference between people, those that had plenty and those that had little. Just do it the way God said do it. Do what is authorized. That's what the Bible shows as the way that the Bible is supposed to be interpreted. Let's look at the same question with regard to baptism. How do you read the Bible with regard to baptism? It's the practice of the Church of Christ to baptize, that is, to immerse in water only those people who have uh, confessed their belief in Jesus as the Son of God and for the purpose of seeing their sins washed away by the mercy of God and being added to the Lord's church. How do we know whether this is a right or a wrong practice? Most of the religious world, and frankly in later years and recent years, 
even some among us say, well, that's just our tradition. That's, we just do that way because that's the way we've always done it. One church does it one way, another church does it another way. Who can tell which is right? They're probably all right. That's the thinking of many people, even unfortunately some among us. But the not, the not expressly forbidden group would uh, permit the uh, sprinkling of infants. The Bible doesn't say don't. Uh, the baptizing of unbelievers. It doesn't matter what you believe, let's just get you baptized. Uh, there's a religious group out in Utah that does that. Uh, they, uh, uh, it's headquartered in Utah, they're all over the world, uh, but they don't care whether you believe or not, they're going to get you baptized. Uh, there are some people among us who seem to, to think the most important thing is getting in the water, being baptized. Uh, whether, wh whether you uh, believe or not, uh, we'll take care of that later, I guess. Uh, what about those people who make no confession of anything, or those people who just... Uh, overtly uh, reject God. I don't want anything to do with him. You know, there was a time when uh, Europeans first came to this continent uh, that they brought their religion with them, and the predominant religion was the Roman Catholic uh, faith, and uh, they forcibly uh, baptized people. For example, off the uh, uh, eastern coast of Mexico, uh, taking them out into the Atlantic Ocean and uh, the Caribbean Sea and, and baptizing them. Uh, that's... Uh, that's what some folks did. They don't know who you are. We're going to make you Catholics. We're going to make you one of us. You're in the water, now you belong to us, and you've got to go by our rules. That's why so much of this continent is, uh, it, 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 or at least Central and South America, are, are Catholics today. They started out that way. And so there are people, you know, if, if it's not expressly forbidden, then, then why wouldn't that be the right thing to do? Salvation and church membership would be open to Anybody and everybody who wanted to claim it. Or maybe even forced upon those who didn't want it. Regardless of age, knowledge, faith, practice, or anything else. And all this would be so because the Bible does not specifically say in so many words, thou shalt not do any of these things. Can you see the confusion and the disorganization and the disunity that would exist uh, from that kind of an approach to studying the Bible. But the Bible does say, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16 and verse number 16. Prior confession of faith is mandatory, as we learn in other passages of Scripture. You don't find all the truth on any one thing in any one verse of Scripture. And we learn, we look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, that uh, with the heart man believeth unto salvation, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Acts chapter 8, verses 37 and 38, the uh, eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? They went down in the water. Both Philip, uh, Philip said, If you believe, you may. And the man said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And they went down in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And he went on, and, and he went on his way rejoicing. So the confession of Christ is certainly mandatory and necessary. But who is baptized? Why are they baptized? Under what conditions are they baptized? They're all spelled out in the scriptures. We know from reading what's on the page and reasoning uh, correctly, and that is drawing logical implications, recognizing explicit statements, we know what God uh, requires of us, what God authorized. Any other doctrine? Any other practice regarding baptism would cheapen salvation. Anybody can have it for any reason. doesn't make any difference what you think about Jesus. Would make the church unnecessary in the first place and indeed negate the entire message of the entire Bible. The Bible means nothing if it isn't uh, a guidebook, an instruction book on how we are to please God in this world. Let's make some more common local applications, pertinent applications to today's situation in the church. How do you read the Bible regarding music for worship? Does God in the Bible authorize the use of man-made mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God? Most of the religious world uses various kinds of instruments of music. But if we're going to answer that question, our answer must be, well, we have to read it on this question, the same, day, same way we read it 
on any other question, the Lord's Supper, baptism, and other things, if it's true that whatever is not expressly forbidden is permissible, then we can offer and worship any kind of instrumental music that we want to, or we can choose not to do so. We can use pianos, organs, drums, stringed instruments, woodwinds, humming, whistling, singing, stomping the feet, clapping the hands, or any other thing to accompany our music, our singing, if, uh, if, well, if it's not expressly forbidden, if that's the right way to approach the Bible. If, on the other hand, it's true that whatever is not authorized by Scripture is not permitted, then we can confidently expect to please God and escape punishment only if we offer what the New Testament authorizes. When we come together to worship God, we understand that God authorizes us to eat the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 and verse 7 already noticed. That God authorizes us to study the Bible. Acts 2 and verse 42. Acts 20 and verse 7. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul came and he preached the Bible to them. In Acts 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In Acts chapter 21 and verse 5, uh, the church prays together. In Ephesians 5, 19, we sing together. And in uh, Acts 4, uh, they were giving uh, from what they had, giving liberally for the uh, uh, benefit of others who needed it uh, more than the givers did. God has specifically told us what we are to do when the church comes together, how the church is to worship him. And worship means to show adoration and praise and gratitude and, and uh, glory to God. The specific word literally means uh, to kiss the hand toward uh, God, uh, to show our love and respect to Him. How do we do that? We do that in the ways that He has authorized. Another issue among us today is the clapping of hands. How do you read the Bible with regard to clapping as worship to God? Well, you know, I guess you'd have to read it the same way you read it with regard to the instrument of music. What worships God? Exactly and only what God authorizes. What God has told us worships Him. Would you re be, be really pleased if, uh, if you uh, got a good example right here just popped into my head. Jack needs a new car. I talked to him the other day. I said, you're going to get one just like you had? He said, just like I had. It was a good car. fit me well. So, uh, you know, let's say, uh, who's, who's in the car business? Let's say Jeff's in the car business over here, and Jeff's got a car. Jack just loved to say this car, and it happens to be <clears throat> my Dodge pickup truck. <laughs> you know, I like my truck. That's not what Jack wants. Jack says, I want that, what was the name of that thing you had? I want that, <laughs> that car that I had, and... Uh, you know, you give him something else. And you think, hey, I'm doing a great thing. I'm giving him this because this is what I've got. Make you a great deal on it. How about for free? I'll just hand it to you. And it's a good thing for you to do, but it's not what he wanted. It doesn't please him. He might find a use for it. Probably go out and sell it to something a little more drivable. But, but uh, it's not what he wanted. Wouldn't we please our neighbor, brother, sister, husband, wife, children, parents? By giving them what they wanted, if it was at all possible, and, you know, not a danger to them. Sometimes kids want things they got no business having. Sometimes parents do too, as far as that's concerned. But don't we please people by giving them what they want? Shouldn't we do the same thing with God? Why do we just make it up in our minds and say, I feel this good about it, I'm just going to give this to God? God didn't say he wanted that. He told us exactly what he wanted. And if he ever wants anything more, I suppose he'll come down and tell us that he wants something more or something different. But he hasn't done that. Another issue among us is with regard to uh, so-called praise teams. How do you read the Bible regarding praise teams? Now this is uh, something different. You can't really make one flat definition or description of this that fits every place because in many places they do different things. 
But typically I'm talking about a situation in which you've got a, a, a group of people, sometimes two or three, maybe as many as a dozen or more, depending on the size of the church, standing up in front, usually most of them with individual microphones, and they are uh, singing and leading the church and singing, and if you've ever seen any of them do this, uh, they're usually doing it in a very animated sort of a way. Uh, they're, you know, dipping and diving and dancing around and trying to get the people wound up with their singing, just like you might see at a rock concert someplace. Now, some of them aren't that way. As I said, it's not fair to generalize what people mean when they say a praise team. And sometimes these people are leading the congregation in singing, and sometimes they're actually just doing the singing while the congregation's being entertained, watching the whole thing. How do you read the Bible with regard to praise teams. Well, we might start in Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Singing to yourselves, the word literally means singing to one another, one singing to another. So all the church is singing together in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And in Colossians 3 and verse 16, teaching and admonishing one another. We don't need a group of people up here teaching us or showing us how the song ought to be sung. Sometimes people say, well, now they're the better singers. They know all the parts and they understand how to read music and they can make better tones. They got better voices. What difference does that make? God says making your melody with your heart, not with your throat. God doesn't care if you can carry a tune in a bushel basket or my eight-foot bed truck over there. It's not relevant. God wants your heart. He doesn't care what your voice sounds like. If your heart is tuned right to Him, that's all that matters. And in that attitude, in that heart to God, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing the truth, just as surely as we preach the truth in our classes and from the pulpits, which would rule out, you see, many of the songs that are in some of our books. Singing the truth from the heart, we're encouraging one another, and in all of that, we're praising God. That's what the Bible says about how the church sings. How do you read the Bible regarding women leading men in a mixed assembly of worship? Here's another issue amongst churches of Christ today in America and many parts of the world. We're realizing now in this enlightened age that women are as good as men. <laughs> well, intelligent people have known a long time that that's a false statement because women are a whole lot better than men in many respects. And most of the things that they do uh, don't very often like to quote Johnny Carson, but I never will, never will forget what I heard him say when I was just a teenager and still watching him, but I wasn't supposed to be staying up that late. I remember hearing him say one time, way back in the early days of the so-called women's lib movement, he said, women ought to stop trying to be equal and get back up on the pedestal where they belong. Uh, I thought that was a pretty good attitude of, of, of honoring and recognizing women for the contributions that they've already been making to life in America and in the homes and in the world and the church. But we don't, we, we, we didn't have before, before, you know, a decade or two ago, Women serving the Lord's Supper, leading singing, um, even preaching now we have in some places. Women being uh, selected as the preachers for the church. How do you read the Bible with regard to those things? What does the Bible actually say about this issue as well? Well, we'll have to turn, I guess, to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 12. And here we can read the Apostle Paul said, as he gave instructions to the preacher what to preach in the church, he said, I suffer not, that's King James Version, I do not permit in modern versions, and that's what the word meant there. I do not permit a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And when Paul says, I do not permit, he's not saying that he is setting himself up as the boss of the church. I'm not going to allow that. The language that he uses in the context of his letter is, it's not authorized. It's not authorized by God, and I don't authorize it. I don't loose where God is bound. If God has said it's this way, I'm not going to change it from that way. That's what Paul is saying. And so what God has said, what Paul is endorsing, and what he's instructing Timothy to instruct the church is that women do not teach over a man, 
or do not, the King James says, usurp authority. If you have an English translation that says have authority, you've got the right translation. Uh, again, the King James Version was translated years ago. The English language, a living language, and some of the words change. Sometimes people say, well, they didn't usurp it here. They didn't steal it away. We gave the women that authority. You don't have the authority to give the women that position. Women aren't supposed to have that position. But to be in silence doesn't mean that they sit like a piece of furniture. It means with regard to leadership, women are not involved. Women are not standing up and leading the church in worship, teaching and training the men. That's what the Bible says about it. And we don't have to go to 66 books and read every word in them to understand what God's will is in the matter. This is what God has said. And God is not the author of confusion. God doesn't change his mind from one day to the next or one church to the next. This is God's plan of the matter. Now, I do not like to address the question of women in the church and just say what the women can't do. Uh, I was just involved in a discussion on Facebook the other day uh, on this particular issue, and a preacher said, you know, we ought to stop talking about what women can't do and start talking about what women can do, must do, ought to do, are doing, have done, and will do. And I told him, I said, um, I hear very few people saying anything like that, but that's what I have preached about women in the church for Oh, 30 years or better. That's what we ought to be doing. And I've done that here. But uh, this is where I wanted to stop with this today on this particular point. What does the Bible say about women leading men? No. That's the short answer. Now, we want to talk about what women can do in the church. That's another question. We'll save that for another lesson. And while we're talking about other lessons, let me point out one more thing that is necessary to understand on this whole question of what interpretation are we going to have of the Bible? And uh, how do we read the Bible? You know, we've looked at the, this morning, we've looked at what the Bible says about the various things. But there's another question that we haven't considered, and that is, so what? I know that's what the Bible says, but isn't that an ancient book written for another people in another time and place? Does that really apply to us today? That's another lesson entirely of itself. I'll just simply say yes and ask you to tune in in about three weeks. Uh, I've got a, another lesson scheduled to answer that particular question on the 1st of February. But uh, we've got some other lessons that have been requested and it's been scheduled between now and then. But also come to our Sunday morning Bible class because Jeff just started a, a, an excellent series of lessons this morning on the evidence behind our faith. And we're going to be seeing principles that are going to answer this question as well. Does the Bible really apply to me here, now, today? The answer is going to be yes. But let's find out why. Let's see just what the evidence of conclusion is from all of that. Indeed, the Bible can be understood. is intended to be understood. It can be understood by all men alike. It's supposed to be understood by all men alike. If we understand the Bible at all, we understand it alike. But we can only do that if we follow the Bible's own method of interpretation. Listen to what God said. Look at his explicit statements and say, well, that's what he said. That's what he meant. Don't twist it into something that isn't there. And look at the uh, records of what else was going on and draw logical conclusions from that. If we need some training in how to use our minds to draw logical conclusions, then we can do that. Uh, a logical conclusion doesn't necessarily mean what seems good or feels good to me or what I'd like it to be. And that's the way many people try to do it. Well, it seems logical to me just because, you know, it fits in with what I'd like it to be. That's not logic. That's not a, uh, a, 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 an implication or a conclusion to be drawn from the text that is there. But the Bible has to be understood for what is written. We can't make laws on what is not written there. If God hasn't authorized it, it's not authorized. So when you read the Bible and try to compare it with your life, what do you read in the Bible? What do you read in your own life? Is there compatibility there? Does your life look like the Bible? Have you been using the Bible the way God gave it as a guide to your life? 
what's right, what's wrong, what you should be doing, what you should be avoiding. God tells us exactly what he wants from us. He wants us to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is his only begotten son. The long promised and awaited Messiah, the savior of the world, whose death paid the price in the mind of God for your sins and mine. So that God, through his mercy, will look upon you and me as people who have no sin, righteous before God, sin-free, but only if we follow Jesus, walk in his steps, do what he instructed, please God by learning what should I do about Jesus. We mentioned twice already today, people were asking the apostles and the preachers, what must I do? Why can't I do this? What did God give an answer to that? What must I do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was Peter's answer in Acts chapter 2. Uh, what, my, what shall I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked, Paul and Silas. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people like to stop right there with verse 31 in Acts chapter 16. That's not where Paul stopped. That's not where Luke stopped in his record of what they discussed and what they did. They went on to do the same thing Philip did, preached unto him Jesus. They told him what he needed to believe, just as Philip did on the road uh, to Gaza with the Ethiopian. And when he heard what to do to believe, he uh, washed his stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. Immediately, right then, the same hour of the night. That should be our response to God. There is a God in heaven. The Bible is his book. A judgment day is coming. Heaven and hell are real places. And you are going to be forever conscious and alert in one or the other. In exquisite bliss and joy and peace and rest with Almighty God. Or in unmentionable, indescribable suffering, pain and torment. In the fires of hell with Satan. And it all depends on how you respond to God's word. Become a Christian. Be baptized into Jesus Christ and be added to his church. And then go on the rest of your life walking in the light as God himself is in the light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. And if you haven't been doing that, there's never going to be a better time to start than right now. Or a better place than right here among people who love God and love you. And if you need to repent from your sins, if you need to get right with God, why don't you come to forward right now and let us know while we stand and sit.